Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Hope for Healthcare with Dr. Katie Cole in partnership with ICD Healthcare Network. Dr. Katie Cole is a holistic physician, organizational well-being consultant, and change agent, working with industry leaders and proven strategies to heal our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. Stay tuned to hear today's speaker. Welcome to Hope for Healthcare. Today, I have a very distinguished guest that I would like to introduce to you, Dr. Paul Deschant. He is CEO and founder of his own consulting organization and a recognized expert on clinician burnout. He speaks from a combined experience as being a family physician, a medical group CEO, as well as a consultant to C-level leaders on reducing burnout while building the bottom line. He also has co-authored this amazing book, Uh, with Dr. Diane Shannon called Preventing Physician Burnout and Curing the Chaos and Returning the Joy to the Practice of Medicine. And I encourage each and every one of you to please check out this book. Um, It's very inspirational and solution focused on really resolving burnout and promoting um, professional fulfillment. So thank you so much for being here today, Paul, and welcome. Thank you, Katie. It's my pleasure. I really am looking forward to this conversation. Me too, Paul. And, you know, we're we're so excited. We have the upcoming June Symposium in New York City. Uh, in, it's June 23rd through the 24th, and you're going to be co-chairing this symposium. I am. Yeah. And in fact, there, I'm actually going to be doing a workshop the day before the formal symposium starts. So on Wednesday, the 22nd, I'm going to do a workshop on how to implement Uh, lean techniques that actually can directly address some of the drivers of burnout. But in the symposium itself, we've got a fantastic lineup. You know, over the past eight years that I've been doing this consulting, focusing on trying to reduce burnout by fixing the workplace, not fixing the workers, not, you know, people need resilience, but we need to reduce the need for resilience. Um, Initially, that work really, back eight years ago, everybody was focused on making, helping doctors and nurses be more resilient. Yeah. About four or five years ago, people switched to saying, let's try to make the workplace work better for people, create that practice efficiency. In the last year or so, there's been far more focus on the, the organizational culture and leadership impacts on burnout. And this conference is going to have much more of that in it, which is really something I'm pretty excited about. Yes. And, you know, I also thought, you know, back in January and um, earlier this year, you also co-chaired a burnout symposium in San Francisco. And what I was so impressed about was how hopeful everything seemed to be. And actually that is why I decided to launch this podcast and call it Hope for Healthcare because of your presentation and um, the speaker lineup that you had. And it was so solution focused. I felt like as a physician and a psychiatrist, it was very inspirational to know that change is actually happening right now. And you actually have a consulting firm that is actually working with hospital organizations around the country. Yeah, change is happening. I, I, I'd certainly like to see it happening faster than it is. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, yeah. I've done a lot of work, you know, clearly I, you know, I enjoy clinical medicine and patient care but I also enjoy business. And one of the business books that uh, was one of the seminal ones for me was Jim Collins, Good to Great, and has this concept in there about getting the flywheel started. When you're trying to drive change, getting momentum started at first is hard. And indeed, that's where I feel like we're still at here is we're getting that, the flywheel is starting to move. People are starting to recognize things. There's so much potential for it to really start to take off now. Uh, If we can get, continue to muster the forces around not just frontline clinicians, but then also mid-level managers Mm -hmm. and senior leaders. And I'm even thinking more these days about that ecosystem that surrounds our health systems, all the governmental regulatory issues, uh, the insurance industry, and just the demographics and changes in the country as a whole. You know, all of these are going to have to come together. But where we can really make a difference right now is just making workplaces work better for clinicians and for patients. Yeah, well, that, that um, thank you so much for unwrapping that concept. It, it's a pretty large concept that to really impact change in healthcare, it's going to come from multiple avenues and directions in healthcare across the continuum. 
Um, and what I noticed about the January symposium is you really did accomplish that. You know, you had uh, several speakers like Dr. Beeson focusing on the patient and clinician experience and the patient clinician relationship and how that can really uh, facilitate and bring back joy on the front line, you know, um, helping physicians and nurses remember why we went into medicine to begin with, to really be with the patient and evolve in those relationships. Um, but also you guys were able to focus on some advocacy. Corey Feist also spoke about the Lauren, Lorna Breen Foundation and how he is impacting healthcare uh, from a standpoint of advocacy and um, getting the recent Lorna Breen law passed. Right, right. And so that's, and Corey's work is so important because it focuses on reducing the stigma that we all feel when we start to feel burned out and yet mm -hmm. are really afraid to even acknowledge that for fear that it will be then thought of as a lesser clinician and it could put our livelihoods at risk. Um, so, uh, and he's done great work. In fact, one of the speakers, uh, the kickoff uh, speaker for the burnout symposium in June will be Senator Tim Kaine, who Corey worked with directly on developing the Lorna Breen Foundation Act. Um, he, he, uh, Corey's from Virginia, as was Lorna, and, their, um, and, and Senator Kane's from Virginia as well. Uh, unfortunately, we're gonna be followed there by um, Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General. So we really are starting out with some of the people that have the major impact on policy and uh, how, you know, how this whole ecosystem that surrounds healthcare is addressed. Uh, we've got some other people that are uh, a similar focus uh, coming in. Um, uh, Bob Chapman is a, a CEO of a large industrial manufacturing uh, conglomerate. And he had this insight that if he treated all of his people well inside of his company, which does things like makes bottle washers for Budweiser, you know, this is not a, <laughs> It's not a, from a, if you step back and look at it and say, is this a mission driven organization like healthcare? It's not, but he's created this mission to treat everyone well within his organization and he's had fantastic results. And he now actually uh, not just encourages, but even challenges leaders uh, in industries, across, you know, across all industries, across the country, even across the world on how they can have this similar impact. Mm -hmm. And I know that it makes a difference. In fact, when I was CEO, of a 300 physician group, we had 1,100 staff, about a $300 million net revenue. We took that same concept, uh, and I hadn't even met Bob yet. I, I realized later what we were doing after I talked with him. Uh, that concept of treating everyone with respect and then helping everyone be able to bring their great ideas to work and make things better. It's that whole concept of recognizing everyone working in healthcare is a knowledge worker. We have to act autonomously and solve problems on the fly. And you can't be in a production line mode. You can't be micromanaged and do that effectively. But learning how to empower people and at the same time do it in a way that everyone is aligned working together can be a real challenge. And we're starting to truly understand that better and see ways that we can put into place management systems and cultures that, that actually make that possible. And when we do that, that's when we achieve great success. Yeah, well, that's, thank you, Paul, for explaining that concept. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to meeting Bob Chapman. I've heard about him through multiple different uh, organizations. And so that's going to be exciting to have him there. Um, you also mentioned that we're really in healthcare, we're looking at some organizational models for professional fulfillment and alignment outside of healthcare. And Bob, like you said, Bob Chapman is in a different industry than healthcare. And we're looking at what he is doing with how with his leadership and management. Can you talk a little bit more about other models outside of healthcare that we're starting to look at for the well-being community? Hmm. That's a good one. I'm not sure I have too many of those. Um, there, there's one actually that's been being, I don't know if it's truly outside of healthcare as much as it's building off of other work that's done outside of healthcare. Uh, in Rochester, New York, right. uh, where uh, Dr. Michael Privetera is a psychiatrist just recently retired from the University of Rochester. Uh, but they're looking across the city of Rochester at a process to actually enhance the city, realizing it's got tremendous potential that's unrealized. And the work that they're doing across other industries in the city, they're now starting to turn around and apply in healthcare as well. And this looks, it looks like a very interesting model 
And ultimately what it's doing is it's helping the sort of the, the dyads, if you think about a three-way relationship, in, mm -hmm. in, at least in some parts of healthcare with patients and then doctors and nurses, and then the administrators, uh, you know, there's, there are three separate uh, entities. Um, they're all having to interact in this system, but it's rare we get a chance to step back and talk with each other about those kind of things. So this is a model that's been actually developed for other industries, but now looking at healthcare in Rochester, they're pulling together teams of doctors and doctors, nurses, and patients to talk about the challenges that happen and, and develop empathy more for each other. Uh, then they're also doing it with clinicians and administrators because there's such a chasm in so many organizations there. You know, there's a lot of d disconnect even and distrust between clinicians and administrators, but getting them to come together, listen to each other and understand the challenges they're under uh, can start to make a big difference as well. So that's one other way uh, that that's, that's developing. Yes, and isn't Dr. Privatera going to be speaking at our upcoming symposium in June? He is. Okay. Uh, yeah, so he's, he's another great, great resource and he, he's fascinating. He's done amazing work on what he, what, what's known as human factors engineering, which sounds awfully nerdy, but it gets, <laughs> it gets into all the issues that really address what causes burnout. Yeah. You know, it's, it's about how we go, what, what does it take to get through a day? What are the you know, there's certainly factors like how, how do you interact with a computer and what impact does that have on your eyes, on your neck, on your wrists, you know, all of the different physical things that can oh, yeah. happen. But it also looks at the psychosocial aspects of it as well. And one of the fascinating things I've learned in the course of this work that I've done is not only everybody's pretty much aware of the three manifestations of burnout, exhaustion, cynicism, and that sense of inefficacy. Uh, fewer people are aware of the six drivers of burnout that Maslow identified. And when we look at these, it really starts to make sense to us. Because the first one is work overload. You know, we work in these time pressured, chaotic environments with information overload, and we just become exhausted. And oftentimes people are yeah. working, you know, 12 to 16 hours a day just to get their work done. It's, it's yeah. truly overload. When we're overloaded, then the, we see the second man or the second driver of burnout come into play, which is loss of control. And control is a big deal to us as physicians. Mm -hmm. we, we spend a decade of our 20s getting the knowledge and skills we need so we can take control in situations where we need to and people want us to. But too often now, there's many ways we're losing control. Yeah. People, other people are dictating our schedule or even dictating patient care through prior authorizations and things like that. Mm -hmm. When And in fact, that control is one of the intangible rewards we look for when we enter the profession. There, and insufficient reward is the third driver of burnout. Mm -hmm. There's other things like professional recognition that are suffering. And one of those I like to think about as a reward is the is collegiality? Doctors and nurses mm -hmm. were fun people to be with. It's really engaging and interesting, <laughs> and yet we so we have rarer and rarer opportunities to really connect these days. In fact, breakdown of community is the fourth driver. I was burnout. just going to say that's so important, yeah. and that's you know that's one of the things I look forward to in my day in clinic is interaction with other physicians and and team members as well. Um, that's what makes it fun and part of the differential diagnosis and comparing and, and the team aspect to patient care. But when you don't have time in your day to do that, and it's just see a patient and get on the EMR and document and see another patient and get on the EMR and document. And it's all about getting the documentation done so I can go home with, and have dinner with my family and then finish my documentation before bed. Right. <laughs> Pajama yeah. time, oh. they call it. So. <laughs> right. Pajama time. It, well, it's all, you know, that whole community thing is just not what it used to be. No. You know, I trained well before the EHR came into play and you know, we would st stand at the nursing station, talk to the nurses, talk, discuss a case. Didn't really matter who even wrote the, the order into the chart because if, you know, if the nurse did, the doc would co-sign it. That was it. Nowadays, you know, the, first of all, we separated, you know, office-based and hospital-based care to a significant degree. So there's mm -hmm. uh, doctors who don't even see each other in those ways. The doctor's lounge is so rarely full these days because people are too busy to hang out. And then with the EHR, you know, you can go into a room full of hospitalists in a hospital, but they're not actually in community. They're all each interacting with their own computer, with the EHR. 
And so they're sitting there, it's more mm. like toddlers in parallel play uh. than the team working together or collaborating. And so there's just so many of these barriers to our ability to be connected and in community. And you know, when we're that stressed and we feel disconnected, we start to wonder if we're being treated fairly mm -hmm. or we even see ways that we're not being treated fairly. And mm -hmm. absence that, of fairness is the- Yeah, fifth. that's another driver of burnout, right? Yeah. 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 And you know, that it's so, you know, the, at the at, at its base level, you know, being treated, absence of fairness means uh, the, per, you know, people in my same group, somebody's being treated either differentially better or worse for reasons that aren't justified by our performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, you know, I, so I'm an older white gentleman. I've got, you know, I've never had my credibility questioned over issues that I have no control over, like my gender or my race or my country of origin. And yet so many of the workforce nowadays as the workforce has become more diverse, deal with that every single day. I'm sure mm -hmm. you've dealt with it many, many times in your career. Yes. And, uh, you know, and then tacked on to that are issues around um, bullying and other issues that happen mm -hmm. in train, in particular in training. And all of these add up to these, we've talked about microaggressions, and we talk about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, improvement and training. And these are so important in order to create that culture where everyone really feels welcomed and then has that sense of psychological safety that, yes, I'm going to speak up. I'm going to either, either correct somebody who might be my superior, but I think this might be wrong, or I've got a new idea that I want to put out there and be able to do that, not being afraid of being put down uh, when you're offering an innovation that could truly make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, wow. So Paul, I'm just curious, you know, you've been doing this amazing, <clears throat> excuse me, amazing consulting work um, with a health system out East. Would you share with us a little bit about um, how you are helping to solve some of the drivers of burnout and promote professional fulfillment for physicians and staff? Yeah, I'd love to. And, and I want to hit, there's one more driver of burnout. I want to just Oh, mention. okay, great. Sixth, <laughs> Let's go sixth, back, everyone. <laughs> We're still in the, the drivers of burnout. There's quite a few of them. <laughs> well, that's the sixth and final one. It's conflicting okay. values. When my personal okay. values don't align with the values of the organization that I'm working for, or or I'm actually having to challenge my own personal values and care I'm providing, right. uh, which we see, you know, certainly um, in the pandemic at, at the heat, when the, when the major waves were coming through and resources were constrained and it was impossible to give the kind of care to everyone that we wanted to give. Um, and people were facing these, these real moral dilemmas. This, the question of moral injury comes up mm -hmm. nowadays is, is burnout really burnout or is it moral injury or is it something else? Moral injury is a strong component of burnout, but moral injury is defined as, as either witnessing or performing an act that, that conflicts significantly with your personal values. Okay. And uh, you know, certainly that's what we hear, learn about a lot of moral injury coming out of the combat literature around combat, mm -hmm. but in healthcare, it happens on a regular basis as well. So, so those, are the, those are the drivers of burnout, overload, control, reward, mm -hmm. community, fairness, and values. How do all those then get addressed? And what can you do actually in your work to actually make a difference? One of the most effective ways to do this that's relatively simple to get started but can have a major impact is do, starting a daily huddle with the mm. team that you work yes. with. And that there's key things to do it. And a lot of people say, oh, huddles, ah, yeah. You know, we, we did huddles, either yeah. we, we do huddles. You know, either they don't work or, you know, yeah, we, we take five minutes, we get it done because we have to. Um, but a, a huddle done intentionally actually can address all six of those drivers of burnout very effectively. The, uh, so, and, and the huddle should have a few major uh, significant components in its agenda. First of all, it should only be uh, 15 minutes or less because we've got work to do. We can't spend all morning huddling to get ready for the work to do. And at first, when we introduce this idea, people even tell us, well, wait a minute now, on one hand, my leaders are telling me I need to be more productive. And on the other hand, now you're telling me I need to take out a 15 minute slot that I could be seeing patients in to, in order to do this huddle. Which do you want? Do you want me to be more productive or do you want me to do the huddle? In fact, when people are doing huddles well, they become more productive because the rest of the day goes so much better. Mm -hmm. And all the little glitches that go wrong uh, get re gradually improved upon. So we can have a better day and actually see more patients. 
it, and, and so when you first start a huddle, you may not be able to get it done in 15 minutes. And then you can decide, do we want to go longer and get through every step? Or do we want to just say, nope, we're cutting it off at 15 minutes and we're going to learn to do it more efficiently as we go mm -hmm. through. Either approach that works best for you is fine. A huddle should start with a minute of recognition and reward. Um, what did somebody do yesterday that really helped out one of their teammates? Let's acknowledge that person and thank them for that. Or is there something personal that's happened that actually makes a difference? Uh, you know, that you know, somebody's birthday or anniversary or something, you know, a milestone in their child's life, something like that. Those things to recognize help build community and they actually help address that insufficient reward driver. So it's a really valuable way to just start the day. Um, there can also be some general announcements, just, you know, here's what's happening in the office or in the system so people are aware. Uh, to help build community, build uh, understanding, context, and perhaps do some values alignment. The next thing to do is to actually look at the day ahead and assess the capacity we've got to meet the demand that's coming at us. You know, what does the schedule or the census look like compared to how's our staffing today? Is anybody gone? Does anybody have to leave early? Is our equipment all working? Do we have all the supplies we need for what we're seeing coming at us? we may realize this is going to be a tough day. We don't have the this capacity to meet this demand, but at least we know it at the start of the day so we can build contingencies instead of getting whacked in the middle of the day yes, with it that is up on us and just throwing everything into disarray. So you're so, talking about being more proactive and preventive um, instead of reactive. Correct. Exactly. Well said. Well said. Thank you. Um, the second, so the next step after doing that is to do some problem solving. Mm -hmm. What went wrong yesterday that just irritated me and, mm -hmm. you know, really frustrated me? It wasn't so bad I had to shut the clinic down and stop all care because we had to fix it because it was a major, you know, such a major mm -hmm. life-threatening safety event. But man, I sure didn't, it, it ticked me off. And, you know, I opened a drawer and what I needed wasn't there. I had to go run around the whole clinic to find it. Or I went to the printer. It was out of paper after I thought I just printed something. You know, those those little, or I can't find some help when I needed help, whatever it was. Um, those aren't, aren't they kind of calling those the pebble in the shoe? Is exactly. That from That's Dr. Right. Maslach, the little pebbles in the shoe that yep. aren't enough to stop you on your hike or walk, but it's enough to be irritating. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so with those, you know, generally, what if before we're doing huddles, do you get that? It happens, it irritates you. You swear, I'm never going to let that happen again. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go talk to somebody about it. But by the end of the day, you're so exhausted that so many things have happened, you forget about it. And you don't remember it until it happens again next week. And then you're even more frustrated. Mm -hmm. So when it happens, if you you know put a quick note up on the huddle board that this was a problem, the next morning at the huddle, the team can look at it and say, okay, this was a problem for this person. Does everybody think it's a problem? If we all do, then do we think it's a big problem that, you know, is it a little problem that we can solve with the resources we've got here or is it a big problem that we're going to need to get extra resources for, but we're going to work on it either way. Um, and that could just gradually help take each of those pebbles out of your shoe as you get those problems resolved. And then lastly, uh, you know, it is addressed so that, so those little pebbles in the shoe, they address work overload because they start to decrease the overload. They address control. You actually start to get some control over your day in that way. It actually, you know, creates some community because people are working together. And it deals with fairness issues because you know those, a lot of those little pebbles are just feel like they're really unfair. <laughs> You're, I'm trying to get through my day and I can't. Yeah. Um, so they, these all have a, a really significant impact. And then the last component is addressing is looking at values, or um, and we do that by looking at metrics. So most health systems now have a dashboard with anywhere from three to five or six major metrics that they're looking at, things around quality safety, uh, people, you know, how's, how's the experience for employees and staff, patient uh, experience, uh, patient access may be considered separately, and then financial performance, uh, which often ties to productivity. Mm -hmm. While those major mess system metrics are numbers that uh, are really a conglomerate of everything that's happened at all of the frontline sites, there's different activities to do at the frontline sites that drive the results on those metrics. And it's determining what can we measure at the front lines that helps us know we're helping improve the overall system metrics. Because most of those metrics are things nobody would argue with. You know, we all want to make things safe, good quality, 
good experience for patients and clinicians. We know we need financial stability in order to keep the doors open, the lights on. We can't do this work without the finances to support it. But the question is, what can we do locally that, yeah. that makes that difference? So we track those and you don't have to track all of them every day, but if you just track one a day, if it's on, if it's doing well, if it's on target, awesome. We don't need to worry about it. If it's not though, then we can start to do some problem solving around that, figure out what do we need to do to get back on track here? Well, that's great, Paul. Thank you so much for going into detail. And I know this is really one of the areas you're very passionate about is implementing huddle daily huddles um, in yeah, your consulting you know, work. I, I, so, and I am, I'm gonna jump in. I am because what we've seen is in this one health system we're working in, as soon as we started, they had a horrible problem with turnover, particularly of their uh, frontline staff in their offices. As soon as we implemented these huddles, uh, we found that the, that turnover dropped almost to zero. And one of the that reasons- That is was, impressive. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was, we were that shocked. We really impressive. Well, that well, yeah. I mean, that is one intervention that is, it's free to implement, right? It doesn't cost yeah. a health system. Well, it, it, Yeah, yeah, there's, you know, you have to know how to do it. There, you know, yeah. there might be some, but but it's not, yeah, you don't have to go out and buy a bunch of, you know, build a building or buy a bunch of capital equipment or put it in an IT <laughs> system or anything like that. Exactly right. So it's a solution that's really showing promise and you have metrics showing that it's improving, um, decreasing turnover and that it may, that it's also impacting some profitability as well. Oh yeah. Decreasing yeah. Turnover. No, we're seeing, you know, they're seeing improved patient satisfaction scores. I mean, you know, everything goes along with it. Um, so, so it, it definitely does make a difference. Um, and, and it's been a real, it's been a real boon. Now you have to, you do have to do it, be careful how you do it and really train uh, the leaders, the manager of that clinic well in the process. The one other thing that comes in with that is following the huddle, then the manager will go around and connect with everybody in the office and in the next couple of hours, just to make sure they're all doing okay. Um, and that, and it'll oftentimes aligning to whatever was discussed in the huddle, but also sensitive to what else might be happening out there. So I hear you saying that maybe some leadership training is also involved in implementing the huddle. And <laughs> you're right, you're right. No, it is, yep. it's really key. I know it's chain, learning, training people, giving, most people want to do a good job, and they, especially in healthcare, we want to be connected with each other, yeah. you know, care about each other. We just don't always have the processes and tools in place to do that effectively in the middle of all the chaos that everything seems to feel like it's in. Well, yeah. And as physicians, you know, we really don't get any leadership training in medical school or residency unless we seek it out. Right. And so we're taught to be a leader as a doctor. You lead your team, you leave your nurse, you lead your nurses and your patients in their treatment. However, when it comes to really collaborative leadership and interacting with the C-suite and management and advocating for what you need, we don't really have that training. And then you add in the chaos of the day and just being in reactivity mode. Um, our leadership skills kind of even go down further because we're in reactivity mode and upset and frustrated. So um, I think what you're discussing is very much needed in healthcare. And a lot of these concepts actually in themselves provide some additional leadership training for the front line. Yeah, no, I love that you mentioned the reactivity issues because yeah. you know, we saw uh, Mike Privatera present about these human factors and what impact they actually have on our physiology and our anatomy. You know, increased cortisol levels driving more atherosclerosis. Uh, you know, in, there's direct impact of burnout on the prefrontal cortex and our cognitive abilities and on the amygdala and the way that we react mm -hmm. uh, to, to stress. You know, all of those are actually, I mean, they're truly damaging us physiologically. And the opportunities to address, you know, to reduce that damage to in, just settle our systems and give us the capability to manage things better and reduce the onslaught that we're experiencing neurophysiologically as well is so important. It's, it's, he's a really interesting person to learn from around all that. Yeah. I sometimes think, you know, having been both a physician and a, and a CEO, um, I, I look at that and it's so impactful for me to think about, and this is the damage we're doing to our doctors and our nurses, mm -hmm. you know, and actually even to our frontline staff. Um, you know, everybody's dealing with that stress. Um, how, that's, it feels unconscionable to me to let that go on without 
you know, committing more of our energy to addressing that, which kind of comes back to Bob Chapman's message, which is really a call to action for leaders to take this far more seriously than they are, because the potential both to decrease harm and to increase positivity is amazing. You know, one of Bob's messages essentially is we can make business a force for good in the world if we can make the, the place that people spend the majority of their time uh, transform it from being someplace where people feel downtrodden and it's toxic, and then they take that sense home with them to their families and communities, turn it into a place where people feel honored and positive and want to contribute, and then they bring that sense home with them to their families and communities. It's truly transformative. It really is transformative. And this is, again, such good news that we have the solutions available. And it sounds like we're going to be discussing all of these at the upcoming symposium in June. Yep, yep. It's not easy, I'll tell you. You know, <laughs> I led this transform at where when I became CEO at Sutter Gould, it was back, we were in the Central Valley of California, which is more like Appalachia than Silicon Valley. We were there at the heat that in 2009 was the, the worst of the Great Recession back in the day. And, you know, about in our area, about 18% of the population was unemployed. Um, it was a tough time. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and doctors were demoralized. Um, when we came in and said, we're going to transform this organization around a the theme of returning joy to patient care. Um, there was a lot of cynicism. There was a lot of skepticism, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of doubt that it could happen. And, and it took a while for people to begin to trust it. This transformational work is not simple. I don't, I, I, I sound like I'm painting a very rosy picture. You've got to be tough. In fact, I had a meeting with a group of orthopedists that were very frustrated about a number of things. And after that meeting, they were talking to the chair of the, of the division of surgery. And they told him, you know, that guy, he's making some change, talking about me, he said, <laughs> you know, he's, he's starting to make some changes. I, and maybe it's going to work. We don't know. But one thing we know is he sure can take a punch. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, if you're gonna leave, if you're gonna get involved in change, you've got to have thick skin and you've got to be very aware of what you're doing, um, and you've got to you've got to hold true to your values mm -hmm. as you lead these uh, these kind of transformations. Well, I'm really glad that you bring that up, Paul, because change is hard. And as a psychiatrist, I see that every day with my patients and the own work I've done on myself. You know, it, it really takes a commitment and a passion and a faith that things can get better. So part of that process is having faith and knowing that this process does work. It's going to take time. There's going to be some bumps in the road. Um, however, if you are committed to the process and every day is a new day and a new beginning, and we're going to do today better than we did yesterday. And if you have a realistic approach to growth and change, then I think it makes your organization so much more successful. Absolutely. Um, and somebody like yourself, who's got um, exuberant optimism. Is, <laughs> <laughs> I have faith in my optimism, Paul. I have faith in my optimism. It's a process every day. <laughs> but thank you for that. <laughs> um, I am optimistic about healthcare. I didn't used to be. Um, and, you know, I myself was a burned out physician and a burned out leader. Um, however, the past couple of years, since I've been kind of watching you and following the well being community, um, I've really. Uh, become hopeful again. And I know that because of the work that you are doing in our community, Paul, um, I have faith that we can change our healthcare system. That's great. Thank you. I'm yeah. so glad I can give <laughs> people faith because I share that same faith. I mean, yeah. and having, you know, having been through it, having personally experienced it and hope that have, and starting out, you know, I didn't, first of all, I never thought I'd become a leader of anything. I, mm -hmm. I just got frustrated when my office day didn't go well. And I knew there were things we could fix and I tried to start fixing them and I got put on committees to lead that, you know, and ultimately became a medical director and worked my worked up through these different leadership roles and became a CEO. Um, it's it's that motivation, you know, truly effective leaders are people who come from that motivation. They don't start out thinking, I want to be a CEO because I want that title, that prestige, that salary, whatever it might be. They start out thinking, you know, things aren't right. I got to fix stuff. And mm -hmm. I want to, or at least I want to be part of the solution mm -hmm. and coming from there. And then people, everybody finds that level of what, what's right for them in terms of how much they're clinical, how much they're administrative, what roles they might fit into uh, all of that. 
um, is a journey for all of us. And we all have a different, different mix of it all that makes the most mm -hmm. sense for us. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Um, well, Paul, you've shared so much with us today. And I, I really appreciate your vulnerability and sharing with us your process of change and what you're looking forward to at the symposium, as well as, you know, the work that you are doing with your own consulting. So thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity, Katie, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again in person. Yes. In, in yes. New York City. Yep. <laughs> well, Paul, you know, in wrapping up, you know, if I am a CEO of a health system and my health system's in trouble and I'm just learning about organizational well being and I don't know where to start, do you have any recommendations for me? Well, you could read my book. <laughs> <laughs> It actually, I said that because what the book, what we did with the book, yeah. we interviewed 60 different people that were experts in healthcare or burnout or lean as a management system and culture and, and pulled all that together. The first two thirds of the book actually just talk about what's underlying burnout, what's causing it, because the more people understand the underlying factors, the more they'll be able to apply that to their particular situation. Every organization has burnout, but every organization is different in its structure, in its mix of patients and demographics, in its business approach. So the principles, the underlying issues are common, but how they get applied are going to have to be unique in every organization. Mm -hmm. And this really gives you the tools to understand that and do that well. Um, so that, that's really key. I think the other thing is to recognize that indeed, in healthcare particularly, probably more so than most other industries, uh, the, the people who are doing the work that really matters the most are the people on the front lines. You know, the most important person in the healthcare system is the patient. Without a patient, we have no reason for to have our jobs or no reason for the hospital or clinic to exist. The most important thing happening to that person is the interaction that happens, the healing interaction that happens between the frontline worker and the patient. Every time we interact with a patient, whether it's a doctor, a nurse, a receptionist, a transport person, the EVS person cleaning a room, if your patient's there, it's an opportunity to have a healing interaction, to reduce some anxiety or worry, relieve some pain or suffering, do some definitive treatment, or educate people to be healthier. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing happening in our healthcare organizations. Now, as a family doctor for 25 years, I probably had close to 100,000 of those healing interactions. But as I moved up the chain, became the CEO, I was no longer seeing patients. I wasn't doing the most important thing to the most important person in our organization. My job became making sure those people on the front lines have what they needed so they could do that well. When you And, and all of the support staff, HR, IT, finance, you name it, are all, that's their job as well, is to make sure the people on the front lines have what they need to do that well. When we can come at leadership with that mindset and that becomes paramount, then we truly succeed because we help these amazing knowledge workers to have to be empowered in order to, to function well in the moment, but also create uh, processes which create that alignment so that we're all working together. Very well said. You have me sold, Paul. <laughs> I'm calling you today and I'm booking a consultation. All right, let's all do right. it. <laughs> All right. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much and for being a guest on Hope for Healthcare today, Paul. And, you know, we've certainly learned a lot and I will be posting this information on our website. Um, we will also be posting on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, et cetera. So uh, thank you again, Paul, for being here today. And in wrapping up, we look forward to hopefully seeing you at the symposium in New York. And if you're unable to attend in person, uh, please feel free to sign up virtually and you'll have access to all of the presentations. And thank you, Katie, for everything you are doing because oh. I'm amazed at the amount of investment you've made personally, the energy you bring to this. Oh. Um, I, I, it gives me great hope. So thanks so well, much. <laughs> thank you. We inspire each other, you know. <laughs> It's important to have that in our community. Yep. So thank you, Paul. It means a lot coming from you. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful week. And thank you for tuning in.